Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. Our topic for today is climate change, climate crisis. It's time for entrepreneurs to take action. So in this session, you'll learn how Leaders for Climate Action, a climate protection initiative, already managed to save over 123,000 tons of carbon emissions, and how you as an entrepreneur, as a VC, or how the startup you are working for can actually contribute and make it. I'm very excited. I'll be talking to one of the co-founders of Leaders for Climate Action, Ferry Heilemann. So welcome, Ferry. Welcome, Mickey. Thanks for being here. So, Ferry is a serial entrepreneur, climate activist, and early stage investor. In 20, no, 2009, he and his brother Fabian founded Daily Deal, the first European couponing portal, sold that to Google, and then after that, a few years after that, Ferry co-founded Forto, formerly known as Trade Hub, which he just left now to become chairman of the board of Forto to be able to focus more on his climate activist activities. Privately, Ferry has done more than 25 early stage investments and is also a venture partner at Early Bird Ventures. Ferry is passionate about finding the most impactful ways to fight the climate crisis and create a sustainable society, which is why he co-founded Leaders for Climate Action. Leaders for Climate Action is a climate protection initiative or community with almost 500 members now, consisting of mostly entrepreneurs and also a few people. So as always, if you have any questions, please post them on the right side of the screen. And with that, I have the first question for Ferry. So Leaders for Climate Action, which you co-founded, why is this mission so urgent? Yeah, uh, thanks, Miki, for the introduction. And um, uh, I mean, the mission in general to combat climate change, I think that is the very important aspect. And, and why is it important to avoid climate change? I think it's it's very, very clear if you dive a little bit into the details. Um, I mean, this problem, it's not a new problem. It's basically uh, known since almost 40 years. Uh, 30 years ago, we had the first um, uh, kind, of, uh, kind of like climate um, uh, movements and, uh, and first gatherings from all relevant states and so on. But not much action or actually not enough action has happened so far. And uh, that means that we're right now on the path um, of global warming of around four degrees. Um, just to put this into perspective, 20,000 years ago, during the last ice age, it was 3.5 degrees cooler uh, than pre-industrial age. Yeah? And now we are basically right now in the, in the process of warming the planet by four degrees on top, but not within 5,000 years, but actually within 80 years until 2100. And this warming means that big, big parts of our Earth um, will become uninhabitable. And, um, uh, and this will happen very, very quickly, and that will lead to very um, drastic changes for us, um, uh, for us humans, and will basically change anything we've, we've experienced and anything we know so far. Um, so therefore, I think it's the by far biggest problem that um, we are facing in this century and that our generation is, uh, is facing. And um, uh, comparing, it's basically uncomparable to anything. Um, COVID is basically just a rounding error compared to, to climate change. Yeah. Mm. Well, looking at the past months, actually, do you feel that um, politicians or also industry have gotten around to how urgent it is. And also looking at the, the 750 billion deal or the European Green Deal, the EU taxonomy, do you think we're on the right path now? So I'm relatively happy. I mean, COVID, if you look at it uh, from two perspectives, definitely has a, also a positive impact for the climate. First, the obvious one is that stalling the economy means less emissions, means positive impact for the climate, but that's of course a very short-term thing and it has a lot of costs on the other side because it came very abruptly. Yeah. Now the second part is that hundreds of billions are going to be invested now 
And if we invest these billions in the right technologies and into future technologies that are sustainable and are not trying to, um, you know, to re basically to lift old ancient businesses and industries that are actually not supposed to be there in the future anymore because they're not sustainable. Um, if, if we don't invest into those and invest, invest in, uh, instead into, into future um, uh, industries, I think that can have a big impact and can also accelerate our move into the right direction. Yeah? Obviously, in the public, COVID took a lot of attention or basically took almost all attention over the last three months and any other topic um, was pushed back. Um, but I think um, that people have not forgotten about climate change um, and that we are now in the phase where the first shock of COVID is kind of settled, Yeah, even though the second wave is, is starting a bit more in Germany again, and uh, that we will ultimately also focus on the long-term, mid- and long-term issues like climate change again. And I think we are on an okay path, but we definitely need much more action and we need it from all stakeholders and with all stakeholders, I basically mean on the, on the one hand side, the regulatory body, so the politicians, second, the businesses, and third, also the consumers and voters. Mm -hmm. So with Leaders for Climate Action, you really wanted to drive concrete actions and steps, basically. How can a company become a member and what do they have to do when they're a member? Yeah. So becoming a member is, is relatively easy. Um, you can basically apply uh, on the website, uh, takes five minutes, uh, and then you'll get, get some feedback um, from us, and then uh, you need to go through a process. And on the climate action part, there's basically two levels. One level is dedicated for the actual leader. So we're working with the faces, with the CEOs, the managing directors of the respective companies, because Making a change in a company is easiest if it comes top down. If the CEO says, okay, climate is now relevant, um, we will now take action, then things happen more quickly than if you try to do it bottom up. Um, so, so that's kind of our, our learning and that's what we've been doing now over the last, uh, last year, which also created a lot of impact. So and on the action side, the first thing is that the leader, him or herself, needs to measure um, her footprint needs to reduce it. We have guidelines how to reduce your personal footprint and then um, uh, compensate basically for the rest. That means in essence, become climate neutral as an individual, which of course on an individual level doesn't have the biggest impact, but it creates awareness for this person. And it is also leading by example. And the same idea is then applied to the company, which is of course a bit more complex. Um, that's why um, the leader needs to appoint a climate officer who is then doing the operational work and moving the company into a more sustainable um, uh, way. Yeah? And for the company, it's basically the same idea. It's first of all, measuring your current footprint over the last 12 months. And we have partners uh, that are doing that or that are supporting the company, depending on the size, um, the complexity varies quite a lot, right? For an organization with 50 people, it's not that difficult. If you have 800 people in five different countries, it's a bit more complex. So first of all, understand where you are as an organization today, then take action on, re on reducing your footprint. For example, a very simple thing is switching your energy provider, your electricity provider to a renewable one. Doesn't even cost a cent more, doesn't hurt, it's still the same light, but it saves quite a lot of carbon. And third, again, also compensate what you can reduce. Yeah? And with that becoming climate neutral as a company, and the climate neutrality is the exp um, that needs to be done within three to six months. Um, and then obviously um, continuously working on reducing all your emissions, tr changing your travel policies and so on. I mean, there are many different ways how you can do it. Um, and then think about how you can extend this. And we call that kind of lighthouse projects, yeah? And uh, that means that the second level is then how can I, for example, influence my uh, the partners I work with, the suppliers I'm using? How can I influence my customers that I have? How can I make my product itself greener yeah, or, or more sustainable? And, uh, you know, those are actions that are almost unlimited. Uh, and that is also something that's a bit more individual company by company. And um, we're basically giving a lot of guidance and support for all the standard things that can be standardized. And then it's the job of the respective climate offices, but also of the community. We're also creating a community to, to 
keep going and to continue you know, on this path. Okay. Do startups sometimes say, well, we're too small to appoint a climate officer or also we're too small to actually make a, or, or make drive a change uh, among our partners or suppliers or customers? Um, <clears throat> I, I mean, I think the first level is always to take care of yourself and your direct circle of influence. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're a small company, of course, you maybe can't tell Amazon to become, to use sustainable energy for their service now. Yeah. Um, but um, from my perspective, like any action is good action, any action is necessary action. And even if it's just 10 people uh, and it's a 10 people company or 50 people in the company, it's already 50. If you do it for yourself, it's just one, right? Mm -hmm. So the impact with the company is always bigger than if you just do it individually. And uh, I mean, especially startups start obviously small. And for example, at, at FreightHub, when we founded the company in 2016, we were um, through the same method, uh, climate neutral since inception. So even with 10 people, we already did that. And now with more than 300 people, we're still following the same principles. Uh, and actually now even more radical because we have now more resources and more time that we can put into this. Um, uh, in the beginning, obviously, as a startup, you want to survive. Um, a focus on surviving is a bit stronger than, than on other parts. Um, uh, but yeah, so from my perspective, any kind of action is good action. And, and I think it's also be a big mistake if you don't change things because you can't make it perfect um, within a couple of weeks or so, you know? If you say, who, if I want to become now, you know, climate neutral, I have to stop flying at like completely, which is almost not realistic. And then drawing the conclusion of, ah, then I don't do anything would be very, very bad, right? Because even if you just reduce 10% year by year, the world wouldn't have a problem if everyone would, would do that, right? So yeah. every step and every action uh, counts. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I could imagine that quite a few people are also maybe skeptic about how to go about it because I would think some startups or VCs also say they cannot afford to look after or, or reduce CO2 emissions because it makes their product or production more expensive and customers are not really willing to pay for the price premium. What do you say to that? So in general, um, I mean, you have to look into it a bit in detail or a bit, it, it depends a little bit on the company, yeah? And if you now ask a steel mill, yeah, um, to switch the energy provider, okay, that's a very significant part of their um, whole calculation and that is indeed not easy, yeah? For all digital companies, it's very easy. The digital economy, I think, is it's pretty, pretty easy because we're not producing steel, yeah? We usually have software products or have some connection to the real world um, and uh, and all of those things are usually relatively easy to do, yeah? In the, um, uh, in the long run, um, this will become, from my perspective, you know, climate tech and, sus and sustainability in general will become the next mega trend. And it, it's just a question of time until it also will become uh, mandatory for kind of all companies because consumers will be asking for it more and more. So if you're not able to, um, to have a sustainable business model in, th in that sense, um, I think then you actually need to question your whole business model um, and, and need to really rethink how you want to survive over the next two, three, five, uh, or eight years. And, and again, there, you don't need to go from zero to hundred within a quarter. Yeah. But taking the steps and, and focusing on high impact, but maybe low cost in the beginning, and then doing more and more and more over time, you know, uh, I think that's then the right way, uh, to go. Okay. And maybe just, just another fact um, um, uh, here is also that, I mean, there are a lot of studies, right? And right now we're on the path of four to five degrees warming by the end of the century. And, um, uh, and another study showed that the damages, I mean, this is uh, of course globally seen, yeah, the damages that are created by 3.7 degrees of warming will sum up to $550 trillion. Dollars. Yeah. The global GDP at the moment is $80 trillion. Germany's GDP is $3.7 trillion. So that means the damage that is created by not being sustainable and by um, emitting too much CO2, which alters the climate, is 
so, so huge that you actually can't even invest enough into sustainability because you're avoiding later costs. And I think the earlier you understand this, even this is the kind of the macro perspective, the better you will be off um, uh, later on as a company and also as an individual. Mm. I, I couldn't agree more that what I'm just also encountering um, from time to time is that it's really hard to focus on very long term issues and it's really much easier to quickly fix what's just in front of you, right? So you rather probably go to the dentist with a big hole in your tooth than flossing every day. This is similar, I think, with topics that where you can't really see the impact right now to get people to change behaviors or, or rethink business models and things like that. So I think it's um, a, a great initiative, definitely. Um, what I'm wondering is also, so you're also an investor in uh, many companies, as I said in the beginning. How do you work with your companies or also with the companies probably um, through Early Bird um, to, for, for them to become more sustainable or, yeah, with your portfolio companies in general? Yeah. So, so Early Bird, uh, for example, is also one of the roughly 30 venture capital uh, companies that is also a member of, uh, of Leaders for Climate Action. And we developed a so-called sustainability clause that is implemented into the uh, shareholder agreements. And that means that basically um, all companies that are receiving money now from, from Early Bird also have the sustainability clause in their SHA. And um, with that, and that clause is basically also telling them to um, use the same principles that we're kind of um, using at Leaders for Climate Action, namely measuring, um, reducing, and compensating what you can't reduce and becoming climate neutral. So, um, uh, and this is a great way how we can multiply the idea of Leaders for Climate Action into the whole startup world, especially the future startup world, of course. Um, uh, since already pretty much all relevant uh, German VCs and also now other VCs from the Nordics, uh, North Zone, uh, for example, so also already on a European scale, started implementing this, this clause. And, um, <clears throat> and this is something that we, um, uh, that we are then checking and also making it part of the due diligence and also talk to the founders to understand what is their perspective, what is their view on this. Because obviously it also has to do with, uh, with mindset. Um, and, 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 but the great thing is that um, actually a lot or pretty much all people um, that I'm talking to that are more or less in our generation understand the problem and also um, agree that we need to act upon it. Just often the, uh, you know, the transaction costs, the, the, um, the barrier to actually start acting is often too big because if you want to do something, yeah, okay, a, a, a green electricity provider, yeah, which one? Which one is really green and which one is actually just greenwashing? Yeah. And that's also where we come into play basically with Leaders for Climate Action. We are also a facilitator. We did all the research. We are curating everything and we're giving, presenting it to you basically on a silver plate. And you just need to say, okay, I want to do it and I can implement it really quickly without a lot of hassle and, uh, and can do something good without being or without needing to allocate too much time to it. Mm -hmm. Um. We have a lot of questions from the audience, but I'd like to ask one last question. So what's your vision for Leaders for Climate Action? Where do you like to see it go? Yeah. So um, the vision is maybe two, two steps there. The first, our vision is to turn the whole digital economy in Europe and also in the US a climate neutral in the next two years. Yeah? So basically focusing, again, this is our kind of extended circle of influence, I would say. Yeah, this is where my and also the other people that co-founded Leaders for Climate Action, this is where our network is. Um, and this is where we can have a lot of impact um, uh, quickly. So that is our, our kind of two years vision. And then ultimately, obviously, we can also use the asset of having these members and having these leaders with the right mindset to influence not just their employees, but ultimately also their consumers, um, uh, their customers. And with that, again, you can actually coming from the kind of company top level, also create a, a bottom up, a grassroot movement and hopefully be the tipping point for much more impactful climate legislation. Yeah. Because the politicians obviously 
have a ton of power, but they are very difficult to move. Yeah. Mm. And um, political work is also part of our work at Leaders for Climate Action. Um, but it's, it's not as easy and it's not as direct as the impact that we can create when working together with companies that can really make a change in a week and, and create direct impact, right? But uh, yeah, but we shouldn't forget the political world um, uh, as well, especially in the long run. Yeah. Well, to all the startups who are watching or also to everyone who's watching, spread the word and also check out the website of Leaders for Climate Action to see how you with your company or friends or other startups can become a member. With that, I'd like to switch to a few questions from the audience. So Ferry, we got a few. Um, do you see the current times more as a threat or an unprecedented opportunity for sustainability action? As touched briefly before, I see it by now as a big opportunity because, um, you know, even very old fashioned people learned that you can now do meetings via Zoom or via video conference and you don't have to fly in order to see someone in person for a two hours meeting. Yeah. So I think this forced remote work and forced home office um, actually has proven that we can work remotely and that we don't need as much mobility. And mobility is a huge driver in all of our um, uh, footprint. Yeah. So, so, so that for one, I think Corona has proven that we can work in a different way and that we don't need as much um, mobility. And second, as mentioned, I think the huge investment packages that are now uh, uh, being put together, if we manage to steer those into the right direction, and there is, I think we will be able to do that, and I hope so, um, that can also create a huge, huge impact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so. I actually do see it as a, as a chance and as an opportunity now, but we have to continuously work on that. Yeah. So a question here, can I also apply, no, can you also apply as a startup in the seed phase? So if you haven't launched a company yet? Um, uh, yes, you can already apply. In the, in the beginning, we had kind of a minimum of 50 employees, but by now we are opening up more because um, in the end, um, uh, you know, our processes are more automated, our guidelines are there. So uh, feel free to, to benefit from that and to join the movement. So, uh, oh, um, interesting question. I had just had a look at your Leaders for Climate Action Scientific Advisory Board. Shouldn't you have women in there as well? Or don't, don't you reckon that as part of sustainability? Um, regarding the the advisory board, yeah, the scientific yeah. advisory board was a question. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so our scientific advisory board is still relatively small. Um, I think we have four or five at the moment. Yes, it is all male. Um, it's correct. Um, we are in talks, for example, also with uh, with Claudia Kempfert. Uh, so we're also in talks with with a few female uh, scientists from the climate space. Um, I think, but yeah, I would say it's not perfect yet. Yeah. So diversity or gender diversity is something we need to work on more on, on that area. In the members area, we are putting a lot of effort in, uh, to also winning all the female founders that are out there. But obviously, I mean, as you all know, the ratio of male and females in the, uh, in the digital scene is not quite equal. And therefore it's also difficult for us to has play a completely equal distribution. Mm, yeah. um, another question, how do you reach the fine line between nudging, or how do you reach the fine line between nudging, persuading, enforcing um, people, employees, or leaders towards sustainability? I yeah. mean, in how, to, how to balance it probably, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's a good question, yeah? And I think, I mean, in the end, we can't force anyone to do anything. I mean, all of this um, uh, is something, obviously we talk to people and we try to convince them uh, of this topic. Um, it's, uh, I think in the end, it needs to come through an own realization, yeah? And for me, for example, I started reading and learning more about climate change roughly six years ago 
Um, before that, I had not much of a clue. It wasn't really on top of my mind. And when I started reading, I started realizing how crazy this crisis actually is and how, you know, like, yeah, how big this problem is. And in the very beginning, I actually wanted to ignore it because I thought, okay, whew, um, this is, uh, it's shocking and it's almost depressing. Uh, by now, I think you can't um, ignore it anymore. I mean, especially since Greta and since uh, since a year or so, it, it was at least all over the press, it will come back. So it's on top of everyone's mind, um, at least in the, in the Western world. Um, and, um, uh, and I think the realization has to happen, especially within the leader's mind. Yeah. And, and then you can really move forward. You can't force anyone. Um, but you can push hard. If you push too hard, obviously it's not going to work. And we have, I have a few founders and a few friends um, that still ignore the problem or just say, leave me alone with it. But fortunately that ratio is uh, very small. Yeah. And like 98% of the people I'm talking to are open for it. Some more, some less, but uh, very, very few still really ignore the topic. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe one last comment regarding that question. I think it's also important not to display people who maybe have today a big footprint, yeah, to display them as bad. This is not a thing of, you know, you're bad, I'm good, now come to the good side. It's rather something of fuck history. It doesn't matter what, what happened yesterday. The important thing is that we take the right decisions and the right choices as of today into the future. Um, because we don't need to convince the people that are sustainable already anyways. I actually almost don't care about them because they already do the right things. For me or for us or for this cause, it's important to convince the people that are exactly not sustainable and that have a very bad footprint and that didn't understand the problem in history and win them. And in order to win them, you need to you know, break with history. And you need to open the door and not close it and not make it a bad and good. Just make it, hey, this is the problem. And we need to change this, obviously. It doesn't matter what happened in the past. The only important thing is the future and how we act uh, from today on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another question is, what's your biggest challenge probably with Leaders for Climate Action right now? And if I may add, how can people help you or support your cause? Yeah, um, so actually, um, so the movement or the, the initiative is, is growing very quickly. And um, uh, but of course, we always need more helping hands. Yeah, so uh, we have had a lot of people that said, hey, um, I become a member and I also want to support you. Uh, so we have at the moment five full time employees. But we have a, um, so five full-time employees and then kind of most of the founders still have another business ongoing. It's a group of another maybe five, six people. Um, but we have another kind of 10 people that say, hey, you know, I can, I have uh, three hours um, a week where I can help you. Do you have some kind of uh, work that I can do, be it research, be it onboarding? be it leveraging your network. I mean, a very simple thing, for example, is to leverage your network to win more people um, uh, for the movement or also just in general. I mean, um, to be honest, I don't even really care that much about the movement. If you do the same action and don't become a member, I'm. it's also totally fine for me. Yeah, <laughs> um, I really only care about the impact um, uh, and the action. So um, yeah. If you would like to support, just reach out um, uh, to me or to us on the website. Uh, maybe we can uh, share later in the chat um, um, my email address and also again the link to the website lfca.earth, um, uh, and uh, and then we can evaluate that. Hmm. And the last question here: um, How do you finance the initiative? Yeah, so far, so so it's a non-profit organization. And so far it's been financed uh, from the co-founders. So from a handful of people that basically just did um, five digit, uh, five to six digit donations um, uh, to the organization. Um, we are fairly lean. So we don't have an own office. It's co-hosted uh, uh, with another company. 
um, you know, the, the people that are working full time, they work basically for free in the last year. Now we have to pay them a salary because they need to live off something. Um, but we are also looking for donations. So um, um, we're starting that uh, at the moment. Uh, so there are no member fees. Um, and we are also still in the process of evaluating what is the best financing model for the initiative, because if we want to continue to grow it and also internationalize it, we will need more people and also more funds in order to do that. Uh, but so far, it's basically been fully private by, by a couple of people, and we're extending that now. So also, mm -hmm. if you know someone who would be interested in supporting this course, um, we're very, very effective. If you look at the 123,000 um, uh, tons of saved carbon, we've so far spent only around 80 to 100k euros in order to pull off the whole initiative. Okay, well, well um, with that, I think we're at the end of our, um, at, uh, at the end of our time, basically. If you have more questions, that uh, Ferry already offered, please um, contact him via LinkedIn. We'll put the, the link to his LinkedIn profile in the chat. We'll also post the link to the website lfca.earth yeah. in the chat. And um, otherwise, you can also, of course, contact the UTALK team if you have some follow up questions on Leaders for Climate Action. As I said before, please spread the word, uh, join the initiative, um, let us know if you want to help or if you want to get in touch. And uh, with that, thank you everyone for watching. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you, Ferry. Very, very cool initiative um, that we really, really want to support also as Unternehmertum um, with our whole ecosystem here. And um, we are actually now going on a summer break. So we'll see you again in September. With that, have a nice afternoon and a great August. And see you again soon. Thanks a lot, Mickey, for having me. Thank you.